episode four of the 32 teams in 32 days podcast this is the atlanta falcons edition let's welcome in mark zinno host of falcons brawl play-by-play for the aaf follow him on twitter at mark zinno mark thanks for coming on no problem jake thanks for having me so let's start with this. So it was a pretty quiet offseason for the for the Falcons. Not much cap space to work with, but very exciting new head coach coming into town. Former Titans offensive coordinator Arthur Smith, who essentially re, re, like resurged Ryan Tannehill's career in an extremely quick turnaround. What are the feelings in the fan base right now about this guy? Now, because I'm not really one to judge coaching hires. I'm not sitting in the room when they interview, but I love it when teams get their guy. And all signs pointed to Arthur Smith being the Falcons guy throughout the whole process. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think the fan base is energized by Arthur Smith. I think they like the pedigree that he has. I think they like the track record that he has and what he did in Tennessee, not only for Ryan Tenno, but for how he resurrected a running game and sort of turned Derrick Henry into one of the top three or five backs in the entire NFL. The Falcons have been an organization that really for a long time now has lusted for some semblance of a consistent running attack to take some pressure off Matt Ryan as a quarterback to be able to win football games. And so, I think the feeling is hopefully he'll be able to bring that sort of consistency in the running game here uh, and sort of balance balance things out for this team. You know, I mean, full disclosure, Arthur Smith wasn't my first choice. I was more thinking along the lines of a Joe Brady type guy. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and because I was just I mean, I'm at the point personally where I felt like the Falcons should have pulled the plug on this and done a hard reset. You know, just get rid of everybody, eat all the cap money, do exactly what the Patriots did last year. Right. The Patriots are willing to sort of stink for a year by Patriot standards. Uh, they ate all the dead money from Tom Brady, hit a reset button and look what they did this offseason. They locked and reloaded. They're in position right now to sort of compete again for the AFC East title. Uh, you know, again, questions at quarterback for them, obviously, but still it's one of those things where with a new coach, a new GM, you're turning the entire organization over. It's a great time to kind of cut bait from uh, your quarterback that you have and start fresh with a new quarterback. I thought all those things sort of should have been in play this off season. They didn't go down that road. And I get it. And I understand it. I'm, I'm not saying that they're wrong for doing it, but at some point in time, you've got to acknowledge that you're going to have a different quarterback other than Matt Ryan. And I don't know that there is ever a good time to separate yourself from a franchise quarterback like Matt Ryan, like the best quarterback in your franchise's history. Right. But the Giants did it with Eli Manning. The Chargers did it with Phillip Rivers. I mean, it happens. It's the, and the Patriots did it with Tom Brady. It happens. It's the natural course of business in the NFL. And, and ownership and GMs who know how to pick those spots and do it right are the ones that rebound the quickest and, and their rebuilding process doesn't take as long. So I felt like it was an opportune time to do that, bringing in Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot. They stayed with what they got at this point in time. Obviously, the restructure for Matt Ryan is keeping him here for at least – one more year, most likely two. So that may change things going forward. But um, I, I think there's a certain level of, of excitement for Arthur Smith. And I'm genuinely curious to see uh, what kind of changes he'll bring offensively to the team. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the like pretty much what the Patriots did. It's, it's really underrated at having all these guys coming off the books and then what that does for the for the cap room. The next year, they got the, the dead money from Brady, a ton of opt-outs that they're going to get back, but they've never had this much cap space. And I was also interested to see what the, the Falcons were going to do this offseason in, in terms of what they were going to do with quarterback. And all those questions are still up in the air, but there wasn't much cap room for the Falcons really to work with. And then, so Joe Brady... I think Joe Brady was was ready to be a, a head coach this year. Obviously, the NFL was not. Um, he he has NFL experience. He was with the Saints before, and then went to LSU and won won a national championship. And then I thought had a pretty good year as the offensive coordinator in Carolina. So I would have hired him if I was in NFL team this off season. I assume he'll be the top guy next year. Um, so, but. He's he's different than Arthur Smith. Ar Ar Arthur Smith is really not a vertical passing passing game coordinator. That's what, what what Joe Brady is, and I felt like Joe Brady would have been a good candidate because Matt Ryan kind of he loved to to throw the ball down the field, but maybe Arthur Smith is you know going to come in and establish that running game because Todd Gurley's gone. They they did bring in Mike Davis, and I kind of want to get your thoughts about that because Todd Gurley gone, Brian Hill gone, so an interesting running back room in the ATL, Mike Davis was the starter when McCaffrey missed practically the entire year. What were your initial thoughts on bringing him in on the two-year deal? Because I, I assume he's going to start. Yeah, I mean, I, I would assume at this point he's the de facto starter. I mean, look, it's going to be running back by committee. Mike Mike Davis is not a 25-plus carry a game guy like Derrick Henry or Adrian Peterson in his heyday. 
Um, you know, he's just not that that type of back. So there will be some sharing of the load. I, I think that's the best available back they could have got that fits this the mold that Arthur Smith wanted to put into this offense. Um, talented guy. I think he had over a thousand yards last year from scrimmage. Uh, not a terribly bad pass catcher, but not certainly his strongest straight, uh, trait that he has. Um, it's just a question, of really, the offensive line and can they block for him? What sort of how? Look, running the ball is philosophical, right? It's it's not it's not results based. It's philosophical. I mean, look at Frank Reich. You can go watch Frank Reich and the Colts. Like I watched that man run like four times in a row, like in a game when he was trailing by ten points. He ran four times in a row. Like no other coordinator in the league, no other play call in the league is doing that when they're down by 10 points. And I absolutely love it because the philosophical philosophical commitment to running the football is ultimately what matters and how you decide how the rest of your game is going to play out. So I think there is a bit of philosophical commitment to the run with Arthur Smith. What the execution of that is with Mike Davis, I don't think any of us really know at this point, especially when it's given that the offensive line didn't block all that well last year for Todd Gurley. Nothing's changed on the offensive line to this point, as far as other than James Carpenter being cut and Javon Brown not being there, even though those guys stunk anyway. So if, even if you insert Matt Hennessy, I know you have a question at center now with Alex Mack on. There's no real noticeable difference, especially in the, in the direction of them getting better on the offensive line that you can point to. So if they weren't great from run blocking last year, I have no reason to believe at this point that all of a sudden that's going to change. However, comma, there's a different blocking scheme coming into play and that may change things. And so uh, again, it's, it's a lot of it is wait and see from that standpoint. I think Mike Davis is a good signing. I mean, you can't really be upset about it. If you're a Falcons fan, it's, it's what they could afford. It's the best player available that was out there that they could afford. And he's a guy that while you're looking at probably drafting somebody this year, whether it's fingers crossed, Najee Harris or Travis Etienne, if you get that level of, of running back, this is the guy that's going to help bridge the gap because even that first year running backs are not carrying the load anyway. So Mike Davis being here this year, and next year with a, a guy that they draft this year to split the workload with, I think makes a ton of sense for them. So let's, let's stick with the offense. Matt Ryan was not terrible last year. Like people say, Oh, Matt Ryan, you know, had a down year. If you look at his career averages, he was actually above uh, his normal 16 game average, especially post Dan Quinn. Um, he actually threw three less interceptions than last year in 2019 and attempted more passes. So where do you think he sits with the organization right now? Because you have to think that even if they do draft a quarterback, Mat Matty Ice is still going to be the starter when the season opens up in September. Yeah, I mean, look, look, the curious case of Matt Ryan, right? Matt Ryan's play has never been the problem. It really hasn't. Even in some of his down years, Matt Ryan's play has never been the problem. The problem is Matt Ryan's contract. And now when you've restructured it again for the second year in a row, you're getting a guy, although playing well, that for the now, what will end up being the third year in a row next year, will have a $40 million cap hit. And it's just untenable to operate that way when nearly one quarter of your cap is taken up by one player. Like it's just a 50 year cap is taken up by one player. It's just, it's bad business. And so the issue is in Matt Ryan's plate. And uh, look, for as, as much as people on social media think that I, I bag on Matt Ryan because I don't think he's a Hall of Famer and I don't, but that said, there's a lot of guys I don't think are Hall of Famers. I don't think Philip Rivers is a Hall of Famer. Matt Stafford, you know, a lot of quarterbacks in this generation I don't think are Hall of Famers. I don't think Eli Manning's a Hall of Famer. He's got two Super Bowls. So that said, people think that I hate Matt Ryan. I don't hate Matt Ryan. I have no problem with Matt Ryan. I have no problem with his play. I've never questioned his play. You know, I mean, Matt Ryan at certain points in, in, in certain games, you could say made a bad throw, made a bad decision, but every quarterback you could say, right. about, you could say about Brady, you could say about Rodgers. I mean, it's just, it's part of playing the position. The issue is for me is that you can't build a team around a quarterback with a 40 plus million dollar cap hit. You, ju you just, and, and then on top of it, it's Julio Jones's contract. And then Grady Jarrett, Deion Jones, you have all these contracts that are sucking up all your ability to build around a guy that's playing now again. And remember Matt Ryan is doing the team a favor by restructuring like he doesn't have to restructure it especially he doesn't have to do it two years in a row and if he stays here next year it'll be a third year in a row with a 48 million dollar cap hit so this is the problem you are hampering a rebuild process you are slowing down a rebuild process because everything is hinges on one guy making his contract amenable and the falcons right now keep kicking this can down the road and eventually the bill is going to come due and the reason why i say they should have hit a hard reset is because at least if you ate all that in one year, although it's completely untenable, 
um, to D 40 million in one season, even if you split it out over two years, guess what? You're done with it. And the rebuilding process starts and your quarterback makes 800,000 his first year in the league, or, you know, what 1.5 million his first year in the league and everything else becomes different. And you start to change the landscape of your organization. But now again, if they have to restructure next year, then in 2023, you still have all this money from Matt Ryan who may not even be on the team at that point that you have to figure out what to do with. And so this is where this team is organizationally and why making those decisions is so critical. Matt Ryan's play has never been the issue. It's never been a, a situation where you're looking at Matt Ryan going, his play is declining. He cannot play anymore. He's hurting the team more than he's helping him. That's never the case. It's never been the case. And I don't think it will be the case. I think Matt Ryan can walk out uh, of the NFL with a certain level of play that I think we're all accustomed to seeing. And I would expect that that's what he would do. But again, the contract is just choking the life out of this franchise. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting looking at the last couple NFC teams who represented the conference in the Super Bowl. Carolina no, no longer has Cam Newton. The Rams no, no longer have Jared Goff. The Eagles no, no longer have Carson Wentz. But the Falcons still have – they're still hanging on to Matt Ryan. And the one thing with Wentz and Goff, even though they're a lot younger, is, oh, you can't trade that contract. Well – they traded that contract pretty easily. And where do you think Matt Ryan's, like if they were to draft a quarterback and start him immediately, where do you think Matt Ryan's trade status is right now? Well, I mean, you have to find a dance partner for a trade, right? I mean, it, it's got to be a team that is a quarterback away, like the Chicago Bears. It would have been a, an ideal trade partner. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, I think the way it is, you have to sacrifice what you're asking for in return for somebody to take that contract. Like, that's the issue. Right. It's like you, you're not going to get two first round picks from Matt Ryan at this point, even if he didn't have a contract, because he's a 36 year old quarterback. So that's not going to happen. So what you hope to get is like maybe a second rounder and, and a future third rounder or whatever it is. And somebody has to take the deal. Uh, again, trade value is all about who, who wants in that badly and who you can find somebody to do a deal with. So it's really hard to forecast his trade value. You know the guy can play. I mean, again, Philip Rivers got $25 million to play for the Colts for one year, right? I mean, it was it, that he just he, that's what it is. And so I don't know, you know, what he would get on, you know, uh, from a trade partner. Um, I, I can tell you what he'd probably command on the open market salary wise. Wouldn't be $40 million. That's for sure. Hell, it might not even be $30 million at his age. You'd probably have to take a sub $30 million deal at this point. If you look at all the guys that are making 30 plus, Matt's, you know, he's good, but I don't know if he's, he's affecting a team the way those guys are. So uh, it, it's one of those things where Arthur Blank said Matt was going to be a Falcon for life. And, and by golly, they, they meant it. I mean, they, they were not going to let him go anywhere else. And this was the off season to really trade him because his cap number was big, but it was one of those things where, you found the right dance partner, you might have been able to do it. You know, the, the, the team like a Bears or even the Broncos, somebody, you know, that, that could have used him to, to elevate their offense when they've got a, a really good established defense would be the kind of dance partner that you're looking for. But uh, the landscape changes so much between year to year in the NFL. Who knows who's going to be in the quarterback market next year? Right. I mean, the Bears for, could, could – Andy Dalton could catch lightning in a bottle and take him to the playoffs, and all of a sudden it's like, well, maybe we'll stay with Andy Dalton. You know, I mean, it's it, – that's the way sort of things go in this league sometimes. So it's hard to predict. Yeah. And as a uh, lifelong Bengals fan, <laughs> thinking that Andy Dalton would, uh, you know, a magic in the bottle year, I, I had to deal with him for nine years. And uh, all these Bears fans are like on Twitter, oh, Andy Dalton, Andy Dalton. Well, I had to deal with him for nine years. You can deal with him for one year. But uh, yeah, but like, you had like, to deal with him going to the playoffs. Seven oh, years, right, right, years. right. The first five years of, of Andy Dalton were a lot of fun, especially in 2015 when he had when he had that lightning in a bottle year and he was the MVP candidate until he got injured. But yep, then the, injury, last, yep. the last four years were bad. Like th that, that was bad. But Let's uh, let's move to this. So breaking news this morning, the 49ers just pretty much jumped the Falcons and are now picking at number three. What were your initial thoughts on the move? It just, it just happened like an hour and a half ago. And do you think this changes the, the Falcons mindset at pick four? Because no one really thought the Dolphins were going to take a quarterback. So two hours ago, the, the Falcons could have had their choice of the second best non-quarterback or quarterback three. Now it kind of turns into they can have their choice at the, the, the pretty much the last remaining quarterback or the number one non-quarterback in the draft, insert Jamar Chase, Panay Sewell, Devontae Smith. So where do you think this sticks them at pick four? Well, look, you can go back to my Twitter feed at Mark Zinner, right? Now, I said this a couple of weeks ago. 
that I thought the Dolphins were the most dangerous team to destroy the Falcons draft plans um, because they were in front of them and a team could jump in front of them and change the landscape of the draft. And that just happened. And I still believe that if the Falcons had an, had in mind a quarterback that they wanted to take um, now that's out the window because you can't trust on the fact that, that you that guy is going to be there. So you either have to jump up to two if you really want your guy. And I'm all for that. Look, I have a philosophy when it comes to drafting quarterbacks. You don't wait. You go get your guy. Whatever it costs you, go get your guy. Yep. That's it. There, there is no waiting for a quarterback to fall to you. That's faulty logic. You know, that, that, that's waiting for the hot girl to ask you to prom. It doesn't work that way. You have to go ask her. So, you know, I mean, the, the point is, is that they have to get up to two if they really want their guy and then remove all doubt because it's Trevor Lawrence and whatever their guy is, which if you want that guy, you go do it. Other than that now, it's like, do you want to, if Trey Lance is your guy and, and he ends up being there at four and you get lucky, fine. But I just don't know that you can bank on those odds. I've also said this, you know, there's a lot of people who are talking about Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts, and what a game changer is going to be. Great. Let's be clear about Kyle Pitts. Okay. You cannot draft Kyle Pitts fourth overall, this high in the draft. You cannot draft a tight end this high in the draft unless you are absolutely certain that he is going to be Gronk, Kelsey, or Kittle. Like that level of player, that level of game changer. OK, there are a lot of really nice tight ends in this league. T.J. Hawkinson, Hunter Hendry, Mark Andrews, even Darren Waller. Those guys are nice players and they're great offensive players. But they are not to the level of Kelsey, Gronk and Kittle. One, because they don't block the way those three guys do. That's number one. And number two, there is nowhere near the blocker that Gronk or, or Kittle is like, like Gronk took on Chase Young for four quarters in a game and Chase Young didn't even sniff a sack. Darren Wall is not doing that for four quarters against an elite pass rusher. And my point is in saying this is that Kyle Pitts is a nice, shiny toy for specifically for the Falcons. When you already have a toy, when you don't have anything else to do with him after that, again, you're not going to stop throwing Julio the ball. You're not going to stop throwing Calvin Ridley the ball. And so, so from that standpoint, you're taking a guy whose value you're never going to maximize at four, and you're not going to give him a chance to base. You need to trade out of four, you think it is, um, and, and just start building in the trenches and being smart that way. I just I, I can't endorse taking a tight end fourth overall unless you have that kind of faith in him that he is going to be that level of game changer. I get that he was great in college. I'm not saying he won't be a good NFL tight end. But unless you're producing 12 block and you're catching eight to 10 touchdowns, which in this offense, I don't necessarily know that it's possible given all the other weapons that are around. Um, it's a waste of a pick, in my opinion. Again, I, I think it has nothing to do with what kind of player I think he will be or how good he is. It's just how can you use him effectively? Because in reality, again, you're going to transition at a quarterback here in two years. So that's going to change things for Kyle Pitts. You're going to transition away from Julio Jones. That's going to change things for Kyle Pitts. I mean, a lot of things are going to change when you remove certain players from the equation that are going to be different because this team is in such a state of transition at this point in time. So uh, what the Falcons should do at four, I think they're prime right now to trade out. In fact, I, I think that they are looking actively looking for teams and hell they may want to call the Carolina Panthers. I know it's really tough. People think it's tough to trade within the division. I say that's stupid. Okay. I have no problem trading within a division, especially for draft picks, right? It's one thing when you trade a known commodity, it, it's like if, if the Panthers called up and asked for Julio Jones, that's a hard no, Like get out of here. You're our division opponent. We're not facing that guy twice a year. They asked for a draft pick that you have no idea who they're going to take with it. You have no idea what you're going to do there and how it's all going to play out in three years. I'll move the draft pick. I'll take extra picks and move back if, if the Carolina Panthers want to move up. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a, it, if it works out in your favor, you look like a genius. If it doesn't, you look like an idiot. And that's just the risk you take. So I think they're primed to trade out. Uh, I think it's really smart for them to trade out. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, I, Hell, I'd call the Dolphins and be like, do you want to make sure you want to get your guy? Because the Dolphins went from 12, then they moved back. Just to what you've got to do at six and, and take who you want or try to trade back again. But I have a hard time believing um, that their quarterback that they really want and have their eyes on is going to fall to them. Unless it goes, you know, Lawrence, Fields, Wilson, and then Lance, and Lance is their guy. Um, if they truly believe that that's their guy and they want to work on him for two years under Matt Ryan, I'm okay with it. The one thing I'm not okay with, and I've said this repeatedly, 
do not pass on a quarterback at four and then take one in the fourth and fifth round and expect him to be something. Another flawed quarterback drafting philosophy. Oh, I know Dak Prescott was drafted in the fourth round. Oh, I know Russell Wilson was drafted in the third. Oh, I know Tom Brady was drafted in the sixth. But for the every other quarterback that's drafted in the fourth round, you know what happens? They suck. OK, they're terrible. That's why they're fourth round draft picks, because they're not very good. Kellen Mond is not the answer in the fourth round, period. It's just not. The odds are completely against it. So if you'd like to pick the three quarterbacks in recent memory over the past, you know, uh, several hundred fourth round picks that have been taken, that that's the odds that I'm in favor. And so don't draft a quarterback in the fourth or fifth round because it's a waste of a draft pick. Go get me a player that at least in two years can be a starter. Like to, to me, that is the point, um, because what you're doing with him in the fourth round is you're saying, well, we'll see what he's like playing within a year. I can guarantee you. Like, that's just the way it's going to go. He's going to play within a year, if not in season one, because first-round quarterbacks don't sit anymore. They never sit. And don't give me Patrick Mahomes. The Kansas City Chiefs were a three-year consecutive playoff team with Alex Smith. They had no reason to bench their quarterback. When you're 7-9, 7-9, 4-12, -9, you have every reason in the world to think about changing quarterbacks. And it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. You're not winning football games, and ultimately that's what matters. So, I've always thought of Kyle Pitts as kind of like a – a luxury like taking a tight end at four is really like an organizational concrete move of, okay this is the, this is the direction that we want to go in and I don't think the Falcons are in the spot where they can say we're going to take a tight end number four because going back the Lions really needed a, that boost on offense they took TJ Hawkinson at eight going back even further Vernon Davis and like those picks work I don't necessarily agree with the part of oh you can't take a tight end in the top 10 because it has worked I just don't know if the Falcons are in that spot, especially with a, with a needed quarterback. Like the teams that are thinking about taking pits like this high, the Bengals, their quarterback is pretty much solved. So I don't know if, if the Falcons are really might even be in the mix for pits. Like that's just seems with just like a, not a bad pick because he's, he's a great talent, but just probably won't work immediately uh, because of, of their other needs. So let's talk about their other needs. So they have, they're picking at 435, 68 and 108 as their main picks. Looking at the roster, what are the immediate needs that you think the Falcons need to address uh, come April? Well, b before I get into the needs real quick, I just want to add one thing. I mean, Terry Fontenot has stressed over and over again he's taking the best player available, regardless of need, which is, is, is a good philosophy, and it's the way to go. Um, the draft can be need-based, but typically best player available is always the way to go, uh, except from where I sit, quarterbacks are always judged differently, right? Because the position is just different. When you need a quarterback, you have to get one. So – from that standpoint, it's best player available that's not a quarterback. Um, they can always use help on the offensive line. This is not a very good offensive line at this point in time. So I think there is a need there. Um, and, and it's interesting because the, the restructure of Jake Matthews, where he was cuttable with a post-June 1st designation this year and very cuttable next year, that's not so much the case anymore. So Jake Matthews is here. You already have Caleb McGarry. Uh, you have Chris Lindstrom. If you draft Panay Sewell, I'm not 100 sure where you're playing him. You're not moving Jake Matthews inside the guard because he's not a guard. It's not that simple. This isn't Madden. You can't just pick a player and tell him to go play somebody, play somewhere else. It doesn't work that way. So, um, you know, I, I, they they have a need uh, in the defensive backfield. I, I think particularly safety. I know they signed uh, Eric Harris, but I, I don't necessarily know that there is a a uh, a free safety on this roster that you know. Uh, can be a defensive changer for them. They still need another pass rusher. I mean, they always have, and they always will until they find that guy. Um, and especially now moving to a, to a three, four, you're going to need another, need another outside linebackers, outside linebacker slash edge guy um, that can get to the quarterback. Uh, they obviously need a running back, uh, which I think that I, I would expect them to take late in the first round or in the second round by late in the first round. I mean, them trading back or trading back into the first round to go get the guy, um, that they want. Uh, and and uh, beyond that, you know, do you trust the cornerbacks you have on the roster right now? I mean, this is a pretty good cornerback draft, especially at the top. Um, do you believe in Isaiah Oliver? I don't know. Do you believe in Kendall Sheffield? I don't know. Do you believe in AJ Terrell? I think so. <laughs> I probably, so. <laughs> probably need to see another year. Um, so, you know, cornerback depth is it's like pitching depth in baseball. You can never really have enough good cornerbacks on your roster, especially when you can't get to the quarterback quickly. Those guys are game changers for you. They're lifesavers uh, in coverage. So from that standpoint, you know, again, I, I look at this and I go, uh, if they were going to draft for need, 
I think the smartest thing to do is to trade back, accumulate some more picks and, and look at the guys of the positions that you need without reaching. And again, Panay Sewell may be the best offensive tackle in this draft, um, but I just wonder where you're going to play him at this point. Like you'd have to make a corresponding move to play him somewhere. And so if that move has, doesn't happen before the draft, well, then I wouldn't believe that they're going to take Panay Sewell. Somebody wants him, uh, and somebody may trade up to go get him. But at the end of the day, right now, it doesn't look like even if he is best player available, it makes a ton of sense to draft a guy that you can't put in the starting lineup immediately when you draft somebody at four. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point because teams all the time just take BPA, BPA, BPA. And some for some teams, that's a, a strategy that's, that's worked for them. But if you can't play a guy at a certain position, you're, like day one, if, if you're drafting a guy in the top five or even top ten, you, you want him contributing in week one of that season. And that, that's a good point about the Falcons' offensive tackles and where Panay Sewell might fit into that offensive line. But, you know, going outside Panay Sewell, let's talk a little bit about the receiving room. So one of the best in the league, and it got even better last year with the emergence of, of Russell Gage, who fantasy players absolutely love during the fall and early winter. I'm sure you guys love him as well. But let's talk a little bit about Julio. Future Hall of Famer missed a lot of time last year uh, in – was an abnormal amount, especially for Julio, who normally gets injured, but he missed an abnormal amount of time. Do you think the Falcons are already thinking of potential replacements, or do you think he still has like a couple thousand year seasons left in him? Like, could they be in play for Jamar Chase at four? I mean, I I scoffed at the notion when they drafted Calvin Ridley of a wide receiver succession plan, right? Like, it's just not a plan I think people look at. You know, like it just doesn't make any sense. I mean. It, you have a quarterback succession plan, as we just talked about. Like, there's a presidential succession plan. There's a CEO succession plan. I just don't know that anybody plans to find the next great wide receiver. You either just sort of go get that guy in free agency or you, you, you pick a guy and hope that's how he works out. I, I think this fan base would absolutely go bonkers, like nuts, like skull split down the middle if they drafted a wide receiver with their first pick, whether it's at four or six, eight, whatever. Like, I just, you know, you'd have a hard time selling that to the fan base where they are right now, regardless of it being the best player available, um, that, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. Julio's probably gone after next year, uh, whether they release him or he retires or they trade him somewhere like this is probably his last year. Okay. Let me rephrase it. If you're running an organization effectively and sensibly, this is his last year in a Falcons uniform. How much Julio is a Falcon for life? You know, again, um, the, the old man who, who used to run the, the hardware store, uh, the big one, you know, uh, the orange one, uh, you know, th that guy may have different plans and he may keep them around, but uh, you're right. That is a Hall of Fame wide receiver. Uh, he's one of the greatest draft picks in this franchise's history, but you have to figure out how you're going to get out from underneath the contract that he got paid in order to make the team better. Um, and in and, and drafting a Jamar Chase or a Jalen Waddle or, you know, Devonta Smith, whichever one you want to pick, whichever one you like the best, um, at six or at four, I'm sorry, wherever there are four, man, I mean, be prepared for some backlash from the fan base. I, I know he may be the best player available, but you better get on the horn quick and hope to find a dance partner who wants that pick more than you do uh, and trade the hell out of there because that's that's just not the pick you want to make at this point. Yeah, I, I definitely could, could feel that because uh, back in, I think it was November, my first mock, or November, like late December, I, I did mock Jamar Chase at four to the Falcons. And uh, there were a lot of Falcons fans that were upset. It's like, oh, no, we don't need him yet. And my, my next couple of mocks, I, I did not mock Jamar Chase because it didn't really make sense. So I learned from that part. And especially going forward, like these last two wide receiver classes have been a lot better than what we've seen in recent years. And I think there's a reason for that because all these corners that are in high school, they're, they're switching positions. They're, they're becoming receivers, all these safeties, they're becoming receivers. So wide receiver has never been more of an athletically gifted position than it ever has been. And going forward, these receiving classes are going to be very, very good over the next five, 10 years. Next year's is looking pretty good too. And if you're a, if you don't have a, an immediate need at receiver right now, just wait, just, just wait a year. Yeah. Again, I mean, best player available always comes with the caveat, like best player available that isn't a position of excess for you. I, I, and again, I know what Terry Fontenot said. I know he said, it doesn't matter how many they have in the roster. They're going to take the best player available. Yeah. No. I mean, you just, you, you, you can't totally erase the idea 
that you have are are uh, super strong in one position and under strength in another. Like you can't leave that out of your case. If that's the best player available, fine. Then you trade out because you don't need that position because you can't afford to waste a pick on a player that you're not going to maximize their talent on, not, not going to maximize their, their overall status as a top five draft pick on. Like th that's the point. This is a guy that inserts into the starting lineup immediately and has an impact and plays from the jump and plays all 16 games and plays 70% of the snaps or 80% of the snaps, whatever it is, you know, that's the level of player you're drafting at this point. If you're going to do that again, other than the quarterback, obviously, um, if you're going to do that, then you better be prepared to make that guy that sort of player because you, other than that, you, you've just wasted capital. You've wasted draft capital. That's hard to always come by. Yeah. So last thing before uh, I let you go, you're the GM pick four. Who are you taking? I'm not taking a quarterback because I want a quarterback, any quarterback. Um, I, I think you hang on and look, if Lance is the guy, there are reports that the Falcons really do like Trey Lance and know that he's a project and he may be a year away. I want the succession plan for my, my quarterback in place. And they don't have one currently. So uh, I would want that because I would know, want to know what the next three to five years look like as far as that position. That said, I think the best move for this franchise right now as we sit here in, in late March of 2021 is to trade out of that pick and accumulate as many resources as possible get as many future draft picks as possible. Even if it's only another, if, even if it's a second round pick next year or a first round pick next, just get out of four uh, and try to trade back once or twice in this, in the first round. And, and remember, if they're willing to do that, if they're willing to trade back not only once, but twice, you know what they're telling you? The rebuild is coming because the assets mean more than anything in a rebuild. Look at the Miami Dolphins. They were able to pull up this trade because not because they were giving away their own first round picks. They were giving away somebody else's first round picks. So they're still holding on to their own. And that's the advantageous position that you need to be in uh, when you are, are doing a rebuild. And if they trade back once, they trade back again. Absolutely, they're telling you the rebuild is coming. And I believe that Fontenot and Smith both took this job under the premise that they knew that they were going to have to rebuild this entire team, that they were on the edge. Because the Falcons are not in a position where they can win now and build for the future. They have to pick one over the other. You're either going to go all in to win right now which they didn't have the means to do this offseason, or you're rebuilding for the future. And so because they couldn't get off Matt Ryan's contract, they had to get under the cap. They were in a catch-22. They had to restructure. But again, that doesn't mean that'll happen next year. Things are going to change. The cap is going to go up. So I think that's the move. That's what happens. If they trade back once, not only once, but twice, and especially outside of the top 10, they are telling you the rebuild is coming. And I think that's the direction that they go. Yeah, and even, uh, you know, from this move that happened today with the Niners and the Dolphins, the Panthers kind of might have their, their hands tied right now because they, they were rumored to, to be wanting to trade up. Even if they still love Trey Lance, if, if Trey Lance is their guy in Carolina, I feel like he probably will be there at four. And, you know, that could be a potential trade suitor. And yeah, everyone wins, you know, everyone wins there. The other tricky option for them is that they can call the Bengals and yeah. trade with them at five and go, well, let's bank on the fact that the Falcons aren't taking a quarterback. And we can get our guy at five, not have to try to trade within the division. And the Bengals would love more picks. And we're only moving up three instead of four. And it changes what you have to give in compensation. I mean, you know, again, that, that domino that fell today was a big one. It's going to change the landscape of the draft. Yep. And what, one more thing that I, I, I want to throw at you based on, on this today. Uh, so the Dolphins are at six. And the Dolphins kind of, so they were sitting at three and probably going to take either Chase or Sewell, whichever one they love. Maybe they, they're sitting here 30 days before the draft saying, we don't know which one we want. We're going to trade back, go back up to six from 12, and then take whichever uh, non-quarterback the Bengals don't take because we're fine with both. What if the Dolphins figure out that they actually do want Jamar Chase and they know the Bengals aren't taking quarterback, so they move up to four, Falcons go down to six and take whichever non-quarterback non the Bengals don't take. So there's, there's a ton yeah. of dominoes that, that can fall here. Like Absolutely. And I think, you know, the Falcons should be on the horn with Miami right now and be like, hey, listen, you know, the first three picks are going to be quarterbacks. Make sure you get your guy. And this is what we want. I mean, it's it's it's, it's an absolutely smart move by Terry Fontenot. Uh, and he absolutely should do that. I mean, why wait? You've seen the first domino to fall. Let the rest of them go. They don't doesn't have to happen on draft night. I wouldn't wait. I would do it now if the opportunity presented itself.
Yep, and more more is definitely coming. This this is not it. More will, will definitely come. But uh, thank you, Mark, for for coming on for the, this fourth no episode. Uh, it was it was great having you. Lots of good stuff for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, and we'll keep in touch, man. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, brother. Appreciate the time. Thanks for having me.